So welcome to everybody listening now and in the future. Um, this is a special free talk with Michael Trout on the holding relationship. Michael Trout graduated from Alma College, BA cum laude honors in philosophy and Central Michigan University MA psychology and his specialized training in infant psychiatry at the Child Development Project, University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry under Professor, Professor Selma Freiberg in the mental health field since 1968 and in private practice since 1979, Mr. Trout has since 1986 directed the Infant Parent Institute, which engaged in research, clinical practice, and clinical training related to problems of attachment. He is the founding president of both the Michigan and the International Associations of Infant Mental Health and was on the charter editorial board of the Infant Mental Health Journal, served as regional vice president of the United States for the World Association of Infant Mental Health, and served on the board of directors and as editor of the newsletter for APA, the Association for Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. He has won multiple awards um, in many different venues, has produced 16 clinical training videos and written several books, the latest of which is this his uh, latest and most wonderful new book, Four Decades in Infant Mental Health, This Hollowed Ground. So, Michael, please go ahead. My delight. I would love to know all the reasons that you decided to join this afternoon. Too bad we're not sm a small enough group that we could do that. But I'll assume that either there's curiosity or um, maybe even dissatisfaction with a phenomenon that led me to write this paper and bring this to the attention of as many people as I can before I uh, really finally stop teaching and writing. I fear that in, in an era in which everything has to be measured so very carefully and nothing really exists, or at least it doesn't matter unless it can be measured. And in which to talk about practice at all, one must talk about evidence-based practice, which means many things to many people, but in common parlance seems to mean that it's repeatable, which actually in practical, in the practical world means that just about anybody can do it. And that troubles me terribly. So I, I decided to reach deep, as deep as I could, for the one thing that I think, if we're going to let everything else go, that we've learned about practice, including child welfare practice, so casework, but also clinical practice with young children and their families, if we're going to let everything else dribble away, what's the one thing we sure better not let dribble away? And so I turn back to our origins. And if you get decide to get a copy of the paper and read it, you'll be able to go through that yourself. So I won't repeat all of it, but I will go back as far at least as Claire and Donald Winnicott, the most practical of people. Donald was a psychoanalyst and a pediatrician, as you know. Claire was a psychiatric social worker and later became a psychoanalyst. Um, and they were charged with dealing with a very unique population of kids in London in the early 40s. These were kids whose parents needed to get them out of the city because they were in physical danger. And so they went to a variety of placements all over England, and some of them did okay, though I doubt that I need to tell any of you what the risks to those kids that were not physical, what those risks were. So some of them did okay, but some of them did not do okay. And those who did not do okay were brought into hostels where they could get more, um, uh, a different kind of care, let's just say. And those kids turned out to be very troubled and uh, called on the greatest expertise of these, this, these two people who were not a couple, 
when they first got together, but became a couple and married years later, Claire and Donald Winnicott. And Claire wrote about this idea of hers, this very practical idea of hers this way. We become, so to speak, a reliable environment, which is what they so much need, they being the children, reliable in time and place. And we take great trouble to be where we have said we would be at the right time. We can hold the idea of the child in our relationship so that when he sees us, he can find that bit of himself which he has given us. This is conveyed by the way in which we remember details and know exactly where we left him in the last interview. I have deliberately used the word hold in what I've been saying, because while it obviously includes acceptance of the child and what he gives us, it also includes what we do with what we accept. So a very simple and practical idea that children, particularly children in trouble, require holding, not physical holding, but this kind of holding, this simple kind that simply commands us to remember what he told us last time we were together, that commands us to show up, even to show up on time, to be where we said we would be, and to extend ourselves to the act of wrapping around the child. My teacher, Selma Freiberg, as probably most of you know, dedicated some of her early clinical life to working with blind children. And she knew not one single thing about blind children or about their parents or about the challenge of caring for them, not one thing. She admitted, did she know? She soon began to see, however, that these children were characterized by a remarkable lack of connection to the world, lack of connection to objects. That is to say, they tended not to reach for objects, even when the objects made noise. They tended to withdraw, to stay in one place. They tended to not crawl. They didn't even crawl toward objects which were rattled a few feet from them and would for any other child be very seductive. And they didn't reach for their mothers. They lived in a world that was absent human connections. And Freiburg took note of the fact that the hands of these children were also blind. They didn't use their hands to explore And finally, she took note of the fact that these children's parents were also, in a sense, blind. When these parents entered a room where their blind child lie in a crib, the parents did not call out to them, as Freiburg would take note that most parents of sighted children did, carrying on a patter all the way across the, the floor of the nursery. Here I come. What's the matter, honey? Did you want mommy? And as mommy would approach the crib, she, her eyes would be wide open. The child would often be moving. The sighted child would often be moving a kind of churn of his arms and legs. His eyes would also be bright. And mother would reach over, making direct eye-to-eye -eye contact with the child as she did so, pull her child up to her chest. The child would nuzzle into her neck and off the two would go, quite satisfied. But with a blind child, and by the way, until Freiburg um, took note of what I've just described to you, no one had ever really described what a mother or father of a sighted child does in greeting. And only because we had those data were we able to now compare what a mother or father of a blind child does in greeting. And Freiburg described it this way. The mother would in, enter the room in silence, approach the child with no words whatsoever, even when the child's uh, lack of sight did not affect their hearing at all. 
Still, the parent did not talk to the child. The parent would approach the crib with no effort to make eye contact as if they already knew for sure the implication of blindness, which would mean that their child could not see them. And so they did not see the child either. The mother would reach over, often looking to the side of the child. The child, by the way, would not be engaged in greeting behavior. None of that motor activity, none of that wide open eyes, none of that activity which says, oh, I'm so glad you're here and I know you, you're my father. You're my mother, I recognize you, none of that. And so the mother or father would carry the child up to the chest, but here's a funny thing Freiburg noticed. They often did not bring the child into ventral ventral contact, giving the child a chance to nuzzle into the neck, but would in, instead turn the child 90 degrees out away. And even if the mother did pull the child in, the child would be out looking away as the child was hitched up on the mother's hip. Freiburg began to wonder why in the world parents would be acting that way. And along with that was beginning to gather data about how many of these mothers or fathers of blind children were in fact rejecting them altogether, sometimes hitting them, but even when they didn't hit, just simply not hanging around them, not becoming connected to them and were taking their family physician's recommendations often quite seriously when they were instructed that the best thing really, don't you know, for a blind child is to put them away, put them in an institution. Freiburg didn't know what any of that meant, really. It's not as if her psychoanalytic training or her child development training prepared her to advise a mother or a father of a blind child how to get this child to reach or to look or to respond or to crawl. Some of the children she worked with were eight or nine years old and still did not crawl and of course did not walk either. They were becoming just as others had predicted, uh, they had become autistic like and that they looked retarded. And no one really understood why, although in those days, you may remember, if any of you are old enough, we just sort of blind, blindly believed that blind children were, in fact, retarded, and many of them autistic. We didn't know why, we just thought those things probably went together. And so Freiburg began to explore. And as she took note, for example, of the ways in which children seem to not get close to their mothers, she heard mothers and fathers complain that their children were biting them. Now that sounded like just another one of those behaviors like autism that went with blind children and many blind children were thought to be aggressive, but Freiburg was a different breed. She was the breed that I hope many of you are. She kept looking and wondering, what could this mean? What is the function of biting? What's the function of biting in a blind child? If you can't see what's coming at you, if you can't hold on to an object, if you're way delayed in object permanence because you haven't seen objects and therefore become confident that they actually exist when you can't see them. Hmm, I wonder what would be the next step. Grasping might be good. And lo and behold, many of the mothers and fathers said, yeah, he scratches me all the time. I can't stand it. I know he hates me. I know he hates me. He scratches me and he bites me. So upon seeing this one day with the child, in fact, on the mother's lap and having just bitten her and scratched at her neck, Freiburg said the following, it's okay, your mommy won't leave you. It's okay, your mommy won't leave you. 
And to the astonishment of both Freiburg and the mother, the child stopped scratching and stopped biting. And the mother began to develop a new theory, not one that included her child probably hating her, but one that included her child trying desperately to hold her in the only way he could. And the response of that mother and many other mothers that Freiburg then began to treat with this method was that they looked for ways to now hold their children as they had not been able to do before, as they had not been even inspired to do before. <clears throat> so what in the world is this thing? Winnicott has told us it is surrounding the child. It is uh, meeting expectations of the child. It is being there. Freiburg said it is opening mothers and fathers and babies to each other, allowing them each to know of the other's presence. So what is it in our work? Well, one thing it isn't is just being nice. One thing it isn't is just being caring. Uh, those things are fine, I guess, but they're not necessarily holding. Holding can, in fact, be awful. It can be mean. I use an example of the, in the paper of my holding an adolescent mom in a horrible way because it's what she required. She had just told me that her father required her to give oral sex to him as a way of getting to go out with the baby's father that night. I was horrified and she wasn't overtly asking me to do anything about it, but holding required that I do something about it. And I did, and it was awful but it also made her feel held and stop that activity. Holding means knowing things about the patient, the child or the mother or the father and holding that information close, both information they've given us, which we never forget, but also information that we surmise, that we piece together for example, we're on a home visit, having been told that this mother is harming her toddler, and the mother is very, very aggressive with us, does not want us there, warns us that something bad might happen to the tires on our car while, while it's parked in her driveway because she has friends, you know, yells at us, and then blurts this funny thing out. You know, if you're so damn concerned about how mothers treat their kids, why don't you go down the road there? That next house down there? I tell you what, I see that child out on the road all the time riding her bike around and cars go by and that mother doesn't pay any attention. Holding makes the next step, instead of our being defensive at the fact that she's yelling at us or justifying why we're there that day. It means to be quiet, very quiet, and listen to the information she just might be giving us. And it's not information about the neighbors. And so we say, so you seem to know a lot about that little girl down the road. Well, hell yes. I mean, what do you think? I can see right out my window here while I'm doing the dishes. I can see that that mother never pays any attention to her. And so holding means the next thing out of our mouth is to say, so you think about that little girl. You think about that little girl whose mommy doesn't care enough about her. Well, I don't have to tell you, I bet, that five minutes later, we're talking about her. And not her as a mommy to a little girl that she's alleged to be hurting, but her as a little girl whose own mommy was an alcoholic and let her run around in the street, un 
supervised, unheld. And all we did to get there is shut up and hold. In this case, hold means hold the space for her to yell at us and tell us her story in whatever way she wants, including by pretending that she's just upset about the neighbor child. <clears throat> so that's a little introduction to holding. I contend that we are at risk of losing the idea of it, much less losing the patience to engage in it. And I contend that it's probably the one thing without which all of our work in psychotherapy, but also in casework, in child welfare work, will fall apart if we let this one go. If we don't learn how to hear the plaintive cries of not only children, but abusive and aggressive and awful, we might think, parents, if we don't remember how to hold them, we'll never get the full picture and we'll never get a chance really to help. All of our techniques, all of our strategies They'll, they'll be, they'll look good, but they really won't help because nobody got, nobody got held. When we go into homes doing early intervention work these days, we sometimes carry a computer with us, for goodness sakes. And we open the screen and we begin to interview the parents about all the symptoms and signs demonstrated by their child. And at the end of the hour, we have all kinds of ideas about where to refer the child and what sort of services to acquire for the child or even from the parent, but nobody got held. And the likelihood is therefore that we're gonna close our computer that day having really no idea what's going on in that house. No idea what's really the matter. We will get services for the family but they will be the wrong services. They'll be good services, but they'll not be the targeted services that that child and or that mother or father needed. So we will, from my perspective, we will have failed. So I promised to Kate that we, I would keep my introduction to about 20 or 25 minutes and then let her yell at me or be evocative or ask whatever's on her mind and, and then begin to turn it over to you. So I see that the chat box is getting used, which is great, continue to use it while Kate and I chat for a little bit. Okay, yes, please put in your comments or your observations or your questions about holding. And yes, pepper you with questions, Michael, make observations, yell at you. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that, but I, I do have some responses to the paper. And um, because I happen to agree with you, Michael. I, I feel like in our world, in our work, especially in working with people, we're so eager to look and see what what we know and are eager to eager to label people and especially I noticed this in the psychotherapeutic world I'm not a psychotherapist I'm a body worker and a somatic therapist but mm -hmm. even in the pre and perinatal somatic psychology world we're eager to see patterns and name the patterns and think that we know I I've met quite a few practitioners who feel that they are very clever and perhaps maybe I do sometimes as well. So I feel what I like about this paper and about this idea and, and the stories that you tell in the paper are about taking a step back and wondering 
and not rushing in there thinking that we know. I have to say that the biggest mistakes I've made in my practice have been when I've done that, when I think that I know. And I go in with my clever ideas. Um, and I think that Ray Castellino was really big on coming, coming to families and being with families from the inside out. Um, but I think the challenge is, Michael, how do we get practitioners to, to work that way? Like I, I don't know um, the world of, of social work or Selma Freiburg. I've read her books and in, in, in great admiration of, of what she created and who she was and, and the capacity she had to take a step back and wonder. Um, but not every practitioner does that and does it with grace. And so, a supervisor will tolerate a practitioner even trying it. Uh, say more. I think that part of the problem, frankly, lies in supervision. Uh, pe people in both social work and psychology and infant mental health and in, in child welfare work are often under enormous pressure to put out the right statistics, to, to get outcome measures that are pleasing to the board of directors and the funders and others. And therefore the supervisor pressures the worker to focus uh, in a particular way that often means that they can't see, they can't hear, they can't be with. So I charge uh, supervisors with a lot of the responsibility for looking after their workers better. Well, I think that when I hear you say that, what I remember is the times when you've held me, Michael, mm -hmm. when I've come to you with, a, with my own concerns around the work, my work, and you've just asked me questions. You haven't been eager to fix it or to come in with your expertise, even though sometimes I really wish you would. And, um, but I remember very well how well you listened and then how well you, how you, how you asked questions and you let me come to it. And Ray Castellino was much the same way. He had a way of, um, of being with people uh, with a great deal of care and love and but also not get sometimes you know he would make mistakes too like we all do getting too close too quick or um, just moving in the wrong direction uh, away from what the client needed but overall I felt like really learning how to be with people and listen not only with our ears but with our eyes and with our hearts um, and from our backs and not from our fronts. And I, I can say more what I mean by that, but I thought I'd just give you a chance to respond, Michael. Oh, I, how do I respond to you saying you agree? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I feel like um, supervisors, uh, I feel like those are that when I listen to the stories that you tell about the work that you do uh, in the looking for statistics and doing home visiting and doing it often in a very charged atmosphere, um, working with cultural problems of, of alcoholism and poverty and um, other kinds of substance abuse and sexual abuse. Um, I mean, I think that there, that kind of pressure on the practitioner and on the system, especially within the foster care system or the um, working with domestic violence, like what, what is the role of holding there? Like, and how can we amplify um, working with holding so that practitioners, systems, supervisors can all have it like as a tool and have it be clear? Yeah, well, it begins as you pull in the drive. I mean, you, you, have, you have to be ready to hold. You have to be ready to shut up more than talk. You have to be ready when, when the dad runs out the door before you've ever even gotten there to threaten you on the front porch 
you have to be ready to imagine uh, that he is maybe not the aggressor that the child protection office had described him as, even though, by the way, that piece of data would look would look would be inflammatory in a report, wouldn't it? Okay. I arrived and he ran out the door with a broom or a gun in his hand. That's happened to me dozens of times. But why be inflammatory when we can spend our time wondering where where's this guy coming from? How tall is he? He's five foot eight. How tall was his daddy? Can we imagine him with his daddy while he's standing on the porch, by the way, threatening us? So you got to do this imagining kind of quickly. <laughs> when we picture him as a child without power, because he sure looks at this moment like a man without power. No man with power runs out the door with a broom in his hand, much less a gun. You don't need those things if you really have power. So if you don't have power, where'd you lose your power? And did you lose your power to your daddy who threatened you and made you feel small and stupid? And if that's the case, then where does a great big old hairy guy like Michael Trout approaching the, the, the door of this house about to ask his girlfriend or his wife a bunch of questions and look at his baby and judge them? Where does Michael Trout get off doing any of that? I first must picture him not as the man threatening me on the porch, but as a child wary of my approach, worried about what I might do. And then if I've done that, then I've held him just a little and it will show in my voice, it will show in my respect, it will show in my not judging him it will show in my not pushing my way past him, but letting him guide me to the door, letting him shake that broom in my face, metaphorically or literally, and then slowly let me in the door. I may even have to imagine lots of things about him that I don't know yet. Is he, is he, what color is he? Is he from a color that's full of power in our society? Or is he from a color uh, that is not full of power in our society? And who am I? I'm a white doctor walking up to do an evaluation of your black baby and you're 19 and your, your first two children were born uh, without the benefit of marriage and uh, lots of people judged you for that and you kind of turned them over to your mother, the baby's grandmother. But this third child, you really want to mother this child. And damn, if he didn't turn out to be sick, or maybe he's sick, I don't know. Is he sick? I don't know. He's not gaining weight. And he, he wheezes. And I take him to the doctor all the time. And I don't know what to do. This white doctor is sure as the Dickens going to judge me for that. And in fact, when that white doctor didn't, when I said, I think there's something the matter here in my report to child protection. I think there's something the matter here we can't see. I think this may not be, I'm not sure, but I think this may not be a non-organic fear to thrive child, as y'all have said, when you put him in foster care. I think there might be something else going on here. Child protection was horrified at such a report and such a recommendation. But the mom turned out to be right. The mom turned out to be the mother of a sick child. And that sick child, by the way, died a few months later because child protection didn't do what I recommended and didn't get him examined. But none of that's the point. The point is that mother deserved to be held maybe even with special consideration as the mother of three at age 19 and black and impoverished. She deserved a great deal of consideration. And by the way, I hope I'm not going too far here and getting into the sociological things, but know that when that baby finally did die, 
the judge called everybody back to court, except me, I was the bad guy, called everybody back to court, the mother, the grandmother, uh, the, all the child protection and child welfare people, by the way, and said, we've made a terrible mistake. We've made a terrible mistake. We took your child away from you and it looks as if there was something wrong all the while. We're so sorry. And I want you to know that the mother couldn't hear one bit of that, which supports the idea that from the very beginning, she was so, she was so without authority, so without power, that she couldn't even stand up for herself to herself. She couldn't even say to herself, I think maybe there's something wrong. I think my baby is sick. I, I demand that he be examined before you take him away from me. She couldn't even do that and couldn't even believe a big judge in big robes sitting in front of her in the front of the room tell her that it wasn't her fault. So that's a long, maybe too long a story to demonstrate what I'm trying to say about how the frame of mind we get into before we ever walk in the door. Well, it feels like there's a sense in your nervous system, you have to have a lot of capacity, even if you do feel threatened, to recognize like your own capacity inside your own body, like to, to be present in the face of all these things that you've named, threat and um, other, other types of, of behaviors um, amongst the children or the family members and just be present. I mean, and then, and from that place, listen uh, with all of you. So we have a really good question in the chat, Michael, that I thought that I would see if Misha, do you want to come on in the space with us and ask your question? Cause I really, I really like that question. Um, if you open your microphone, I can pull, I can bring you in. Nope. So Misha's question is, uh, Michael, can you say anything to the nonverbal aspect of holding, stemming from the idea that our bodies register a presence or lack thereof? What are some specifics that practitioners can orient to in order to increase a tangible presence? Beautiful question. Yeah. And the beautiful answer can come straight from Winnicott who was asked that kind of question long ago and said, in effect, for guidance, look to the mother. And what he, what he explained was, what you are to be with your patient, a child or a parent or an adult, is the same thing that a mother is to be with a baby. You use your body to orient to the other you use your eyes to connect with the other. You use your attention to wrap yourself around the other. And you use your imagination to come up with ideas about the other. That last one may seem the most vague. When a, when a mother goes to a crying baby, she never goes there empty headed. She goes there with guesses. Oh, sweetheart, what's the matter? Oh, does your tummy hurt? Oh my goodness, did you miss? Oh, were you lonely in here? Oh, I bet you heard that train go by and you wonder what is that big noise? The mother mentalizes the child before she ever gets to him. She uses her imagination to come up with half a dozen possibilities. And we do that when we sit with a patient. We never make interpretations, at least not too early, but we have lots of guesses that we're ready to explore and play with and wonder about. Are those helpful specifics? Yes, I like that you quote Winnicott, but I would also add that the things that I've learned is what Anna Chitty would call the blueprint. And that's just a place in ourself, what we believe in ourselves. 
And in my supervision with her, she just, when you go to be with someone else, you remember that place in yourself. That's very similar to what Winnicott has said. Like you remember that place. In Winnicott's parlance, it's the mother. Remember how it is. But in, in the energetic world, um, we often call it the blueprint. It's a slow, purposeful place inside of us. It's very solid, dependable. It's always there. And I teach my students to believe in that, in themselves, to feel it in their bodies. And then to, to really believe that the other that you're with has it as well. I ask my students to believe fiercely in people. Just trust that there is health in them and that it can be felt and it can be seen and it can be encouraged from a, with a variety of behaviors and skills. So there are a few other people that are echoing Misha here. And um, I think that Emily has asked on the tail of Misha's question, um, well, what are some ways or are there some ways we as practitioners can gauge whether or not we are providing that holding space and we are presenting as a partner versus a person of judgment. How can we gauge our performance, Michael? I'm stuck on that idea of partner. I think that passes muster, but I've got a muse on that a little bit. I sense a danger in there somewhere about acting as partner, but I can't come up with it right at the moment. So I'll just address the question in general as if that part wasn't there. I think we see the evidence of our uh, presence and our engagement and our holding um, in the face of the other. In the face. In, the in their in their countenance, in their mm -hmm. expression, and their movements, and their uh, non movements, and their uh, turning away from us, it, it is not as if the only thing to look for is someone becoming warm and melting in the face of our holding them. It may be that one of the ways we know that they feel held is that they become enraged or turn away or avoid eye contact or reach over and turn up the radio or mess with the remote control on the television if we're doing a home visit. But all of these are ways we have to be alert to the, to the possibility that, that we are making a connection. We have to not get carried away with being too eager to make a connection either because that shows up as too much eagerness too just like a mother, by the way, can be too eager to get her baby to respond to her. Almost as if she's saying, do you like me? Do you, do you, do you know, do you see me? Do you, do you like me the best? We never, ever, ever want to go there because this is, this is not something we do for us. It's something we do for the other. But we just, we, we look at the face. Okay, let's see if there's another question here. Um, as a, am I saying your name right? Bunescu, Oana. Do you want to come up and, and po pose your question to Michael? Because it seems like you have a scenario in mind. If, yeah, good. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, I was a case uh, in my mind. Uh, it was a boy diagnosed with uh, autism uh, the boy um, the boy had um, uh, three years old um the boy was uh, did you say he was nine months or three years old three years uh, three, three years. years old yes three years old um the mother said uh, that uh, the boy was diagnosed with autism uh, but uh, when uh, the boy came uh, uh, came to me the boy was uh, very uh, present, the, uh, 
um, he could talk very well, he could play, but um, um, with the mother, uh, um, he said a little, uh, a little words. Um, he um, he uh, that not met met eye contact with the mother, and uh, they the did uh, didn't uh, do a contact. But with me, um, he he can uh, he could uh, make uh, a eye contact. So what are you wondering? Uh, I was wondering why uh, uh, the child uh, was diagnosed with uh, autism. Uh, the mother um, um, took uh, in uh, in the house uh, the boy, and uh, the boy uh, did not uh, play with uh, with other children for uh, one year and uh, a half. And after that, uh, um, the psych psychiatrist uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, with autism mm -hmm. and the mother was like um, how to say um that um, she wanted uh, that the child uh, to have uh, to have this uh, diagnosis she wanted that diagnosis yes 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 and uh, when uh, when the child uh, um, said a, um, a word in a wrong way, uh, the mother was uh, something like that. Uh, did you see uh, the grammar? It's not okay. So it's serving some purpose for the mother to have this diagnosis. Yes, yes. Do you have any guesses about what that purpose might be? Mm. She um, she's uh, the person that um, very often said that uh, uh, she does uh, not uh, feel uh, so well. Um, she had uh, she stay uh, uh, at the home with the child. Um, it's like that she want she wanted to to be to be seen by uh, by others. As what? Um, I think uh, that uh, a mother in uh, in effort in stress that he uh, that she can do so much for uh, for the for the child, and only in this situation um, she uh, could bring so much for uh, for his own uh, her own children ch child. So she gets she. She is hungry, at least, for the approval of others, for her caring for such a difficult child. And for that reason, then she wants to stay home with the child. Is that yes. Correct? I see. Oh. And uh, she also is in, uh, I agree with the husband, because um, she, she um, wants to, to stay at home with the, uh, with the child. And uh, the husband, the father of the child, want to uh, bring the child to the kindergarten, but uh, the mother uh, did not allow, allow this. Did not allow it? Oh. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, also, uh, she pointed uh, that uh, she's afraid uh, because of uh, COVID. Sure. Sure. Which is not irrational. No. Yes, because the, the number of the cases uh, are low uh, in Romania. Are there other children in the home? Uh, no, mm -hmm. the, uh, the only child. So I, we, we certainly don't, this is not the right arena to get into this in depth, although I'm really pulled by what you've said so far, so I want to. But if I could just ask a couple of questions. Uh, what what would you see as the alternative in mom's eyes to this child being autistic? If if he's not if he does not have autism, then what? Mm. The mother uh, when uh, when she was talking uh, with me, the mother was present 
uh, on me, but uh, with uh, with uh, his uh, her child was not present. Mm. Um, it was like um, she wanted to be somewhere in other uh, in other space. And uh, when uh, when he when she talked with uh, with the child, uh, she said, um, "I want to to buy you this." And after uh, um, uh, um, several seconds, uh, uh, she said uh, already, "Oh, I uh, I will not buy you that uh, that thing." As a as a punishment, or some other reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, she uh, at the end of the session, she wanted to uh, to uh, bring uh, as a gift for uh, for the child, mm -hmm. and uh, after that, I I suppose that was uh, was a punishment because uh, the child uh, was not uh, as she wanted to be. The child is not as she wanted it to be, and she's searching for a reason for that. Yes. And she thinks she found it in this diagnosis. Yes, yes, yes. You're not convinced. Is that right? You're not convinced. I'm not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it looks like the people are listening to your story. Um, there's something in the relationship of the mother and the child. And I think that that's what your question is about. Yes. About something about this relationship. I yeah. think did somebody even in fact write in that that would be the alternative to the child having autism that there would be instead a problem in the relationship that mom doesn't want to deal with or see. Yes. Yes. And before um, this child, I have um, I had a girl with the same uh, with the same diagnosis and. Um, for me, it was very clear that the diagnosis for this uh, child was wrong. Well, to, to cut to the chase, which I, I wouldn't do if you and I were sitting together, uh, which, by the way, it would be fun to do because this is a fascinating case, but to just cut to something that would maybe be useful for everyone to think about, uh, holding in this case might involve taking note out loud to the mother that she sure does know a lot about this. That you can tell that she's given it an awful lot of thought. And she's had now three years to watch this child uh, and to give her a chance to document all that she has seen and all the evidence that she's pulled together not because you want her to make a case, but because you want to hear her talk. You want to hear her uh, explore the meaning of this diagnosis for her, during which time, if you're really, really lucky, and it does involve some luck, you might stumble across something like, she knows there's somebody else with autism in her life, a sibling when she was a little girl, or that diagnosis was once tossed onto her. Or she's, she grew during the pregnancy with this child. She grew the child inside of her afraid that either A, there would be something wrong or B, more specifically, that she wouldn't know how to connect to the child, which makes a diagnosis like autism, a diagnosis of disconnection, Yes. Very handy, very useful. So beginning with not complimenting her, it's not about that. It's saying, I see that you know a lot about this and you've thought about it for three years now. Help me know all that you've seen and imagined and thought through the time. And just then see what see what comes yeah yeah thank, thank you for you. thank you for your question thank you fascinating yeah.
And then we have another really good question from Tessa. Tessa, would you like to come up and ask? There's a series of questions that you have um, asked in our chat. Would you like to come? And I, yeah. You're muted. You're, okay, we can't hear you. But I see your microphone is open. Yeah, I can ask your questions, but it would be wonderful to hear your voice. I'm sorry. I'm there, oh, you no. are. there you are. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, hi, Michael. I was, um, I'm new to your work and I'm gleaning from this conversation many different kinds of dimensions and holding that I've streamed in, but I'm wondering if you have a way to offer kind of a bird's eye view map of different dimensions of holding different levels of holding and um, and perhaps especially what aspects of holding parents or practitioners are least aware are really important. Hmm. That's a tough question because I think that that we don't approach this rationally as practitioners. Uh, we It's not as if we decide these things are not important. It's that we approach the patient and maybe even our whole work with certain needs and certain neuroses of our own that cause us, for example, to need to be right, let's say, or need to be seen as competent or need to have answers or never be caught off guard. We may have a lot of personal things like that that then cause us to behave in certain ways, which we will then defend rationally. So we'll say, oh, you have to stick to the guidelines. And my supervisor told me, and you never want to let the patient get the best of you. And if a patient says something that's clearly not in the best interest of the child, you have to point that out and so on. You, you can become very strident when really you're not making a point. You're just defending yourself. You're just struggling to deal with your inner, your inner terror that you might be found out as a fraud or might be found to be wrong or not know what to do. For some of us, impotence alone is the most terrifying prospect of behaving in the way I'm suggesting because it might stick us out there and then, oh my God, we, we would not know what to do. And some of us just can't stand that. It sounds, it sounds like what you're saying is that there is a, there's a need to learn how to hold ourselves um, in, in a number of critical ways to, be at, to have the capacity to hold another in a beneficial way. Yes. As you mentioned, I, I thought that was really powerful the way you talked about the, um, the attitudes that need to, to be cultivated, just even coming in, being able to give the benefit of the doubt or not get right away enlisted in the appearances and to maintain perspective. Um, I think I was, you know, just because of the way my brain works, sometimes having a kind of a map of certain kinds of categories, like, you know, certain physical forms of holding versus present forms of holding or the way that, uh, or the differences between holding a child and holding the parents, some of the, some critical distinctions. It sounds like I just perused through your article that a lot of that may be in your article. I asked that question early in this conversation. So um, perhaps if you hold it in the back of your mind, you can highlight that as, as we proceed without having to provide a big map right now. Well, I, I won't provide a, a, a roadmap because we would, we would collapse into concreteness then. But I will again point to the model of the, the parent, the mother or father. What a, what, a, what a mom does to hold her baby has multiple dimensions all at once, doesn't it? Multiple dimensions eyes and hands and, uh, and, and voice and tone and affect and regard and mentalizing all at once. We do that all at the same time. And that's really what I'm talking about. The, 
the model for holding our patients, both children and adults, is, is given to us when we look at what a mother does with her baby. Yeah, okay, thank you, Tessa, for your question. And um, I, I was thinking, Michael, um, what if we don't get good supervision? What if we don't have a good model inside ourselves, a working model inside ourselves for that kind of holding? Um, what if we became a therapist because of our own lack of that? Uh, that was our, our health and our system is leading us to become practitioner um, in whatever form we seek because we didn't get that. That's very common. So wait, could you speak to that? Not very, not very um, nicely. <laughs> I mean, I honestly believe the description you gave is a description of somebody who would benefit greatly from all the opportunities in plumbing. Plumbing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you honestly don't have a model of holding from your own lived experience, including your own corrective experiences, then you probably can't do the work. And worse, if you pretend that you can, you will do it very badly and get away with it because our, our current measurement systems for both clinical work and casework will reward people that walk through the steps and have no concept of holding. I think people like that really would be better off doing something else. Yeah, Melissa Parrish talks a little bit about what you're talking about, Michael, and we can take her question. And then I have um, a request of you, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa, do you wanna come and talk about this idea, the systems that we are funded by dictates that we focus on? There you are. Yeah. Sure. Um, Michael, thank you. Um, what I was reminded of as you were talking was I was just talking to a colleague who works in one of the um, areas of our organization that focuses on trauma and, 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 and the families that have the most um, crisis-oriented, comprehensive trauma situations. And one of the things that she was talking about was how, how, how tired and frustrated she can be because she wants to do her therapy side and yet she's be, being told to do these checklists that the county is requiring because of their, and that's where we get our money from. And she was talking about, you know, I was just listening. You know, I heard her mention this in another setting, how tired she was and how frustrated and how exhausted and so I just reached out to listen, all right, to, to hold her. Um, and one of the That's things- that she, by the way. Yeah, I mean, one of the things she was talking about was this. She was saying how, you know, um, that I just want to do what I'm charged with doing. And it's extremely complex. And what's needed for these families is very complex. And I'm trying to do my pieces of it but I'm also being told, um, oh, but there's no bed, <laughs> right? Like that you, this, the recommendation you may make is that this, you know, perhaps that maybe what may be best is that this, this child go into a residential, but there's no bed, right? And so there would, there would constantly be these instances where the system would respond in a way that offered her nothing, but keep doing what you're doing, <laughs> um, keep doing the checklist. And, and, and she was saying that she was in beginning to feel vicarious trauma, that because she cared and cared so deeply, the system was designed in a way that it would, um, this is why I kept hearing this, not just from her, but from other, other colleagues that periodically they would feel burnt out or that they would, feel you know like they were spinning their wheels and that they they were trying to do their best but that it really felt like maybe this wasn't right for them and by the way why why are these people coming to you they weren't um coming 
it was, we were in a group and she was mentioning this. And then I just sent out a note and said, you know, hey, you wanna talk? Um, because one of the things that I'm charged with doing now within the organization is looking at both equity and my partner is looking at trauma-informed care. So in some respects, she, she, was, she was talking to me because I reached out and I reached out because we are looking at those two issues in this organization in both, you know, how, how, do, how does equity show up? How does it show up with the, how you service families? What are your own implicit biases? Like just examining those whole pieces, but then also hearing people talk about, I'm spent, <laughs> right? I, 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 this, this work that I'm doing is, is, is killing me. It's tearing me down. And, and so I reached out to her in hearing that and, and, and just created a space for her to talk more about it. And it was, this is what came up, how these systems I, I, at times can be draining. Of all the people sitting here today, I think there's 65, how many of you believe that Melissa created a very lovely space? And, and I'm not just being frivolous when I ask that question, that you are in the system but not of the system, evidently. Right. And somebody sees you as a, as a, if not an advocate, at least as a, as a listener, maybe even a holder. That's a powerful part of my answer to your question. It is that anybody stuck in the position you're in, find Melissa Parrish. <laughs> or some version of her. I'm serious. Find some version of her. And it, it could be, by the way, person in, in an unlikely position in the institution or the organization. So find that. The rest of my answer, though, you're not going to like because it's really awful. And it is be subversive. Yep. Figure out a way to lie and cheat on the forms to get them done and do such good work that eventually you are moved in the organization into the place where you're the boss or some maybe spelled with a small b but you have enough authority that you can start messing with this system that just does not work anymore and is about to break yeah. you can start giving rewards to people like you were years ago uh, but you have to lie and cheat to get there you have to fill out those forms and do them on time and um, then get back to work. And Knowing Michael, they are not the work. The forms are not the work. No. And, and, and the other thing I wanted to thank you for, I have a 21-year-old son who has autism. And so when he was three is when he was officially diagnosed. But even before he was diagnosed, um, I saw him. You know, I, I, our relationship was something that it was everything that you were mentioning in terms of even when he started to pull away from me socially because of his developmental disability, my personal stance was you're in there, you're my child, and I'm going to lean in and, and, and connect with you in different ways. And I think what was powerful about that for me as you, as you talk was we we utilize a lot of your work and 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 um, free Freeberg and every everyone else you talked about Winnicott. At, we do infant mental health training at um, uh, Society for the Protection and Care of Children. And what has always been missing for me that I bring in is that family that has a child with a disability. That the norm is typically when we're discussing these things, we're typically talking about children that are developing neurotypically. And so when I do these surveys, I'm that parent that is thinking, okay, so what <laughs> What if it's splintered and, it's, and the skills are all over the place where in light of my, the child's disability, um, this may be present, but this isn't. This may be present, but this isn't. This right, and I'm, I'm doing this thing and what comes up for me emotionally around, around those things. And holding that parent and that child is 
and, and bringing them into the room and, and recognizing that they still want to connect and that they that child that blind child still needs to connect. Um, so when you were talking about that, I felt like it was an, it, it was the first time as I've done as I've heard this work done, where otherism the you know the, a child that isn't typical so to speak is brought in the room front and center, and we are asked to lean into our work from that child's perspective and from that family's perspective. And I thought that was amazing and powerful because I've attended so many different workshops. Um, and unless it is a disabilities community, we're, we're often not seen. And so to be in a, a, a session that is typical, you know, typically developing and to have that perspective brought to the front um, was was really powerful for me. I, w I wish I had that, you know, 18 years ago, <laughs> but it's never too late. And and so thank you for that. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, we're just getting coming to the end of our time. And um, Michael, I was going to ask if you could tell the story of the family that you write about at the end of your paper, the one in the hospital. Oh. Could you tell that one? And for those of you who have asked about the paper, I have sent it out to the list and I'll put it up um, in my online classroom for you to and tell you how to download it as well. But um, sure, I, I put this story in there on, uh, hoping to catch the attention of nurses and physicians as well as all the rest of us. Uh, knowing full well that that might mean that not everyone could relate to it, but I, I hope they can. The story is simply that when a family on, a, on an NICU is being obnoxious, loud and demanding, and they don't dress right, and they're, um, they're rough, and they use rough language, and there's just not any fun to have around at all, and everybody with a brain can see that they're not too smart and probably not very nice. What do you do then? Because you got their baby. And everything is gonna rest on, the outcome of this situation is gonna rest on whether you can find some way to connect to those parents. And so in this particular case, the, um, the one of the nurses asked the dad, caught on that he was a guitar, uh, had a band, and asked the dad uh, something about his music. And that led to a discussion with mom about something special she knew. And that led to the whole nursing staff beginning to build themselves around this family that none of them liked. And would frankly, rather they didn't even visit the NAM and ICU. Um, they, several nurses volunteered to become the primary team for this baby instead of having just whoever was available take care of their baby. So they, in effect, said to the couple, Your baby is special. We're going to take special care of your baby. Um, they were eager that, they, that the parents not feel dropped by the staff. They wanted those parents to feel held instead. Um, they arranged for the dad to design a scrapbook about his baby's birth and about the very short life it looked like he was gonna live. They created artistic items for the parents while, while the dad was at it, he and the mom, created artistic items for other parents on the unit, who had other babies on the unit. Um, they, the nurses pooled their own money to buy the bat baby a baptismal gown when it was clear that he was gonna die on the unit. And they supported the family's uh, opportunity to have the baby baptized on the unit while still on life-saving equipment. The last paragraph, last sentence is, upon the arrival of the dreaded day, the baby was taken off life support and given to his parents and extended family 
where the baby died in the arms of those loved ones, surrounded by the entire staff of that NICU. Now, it's a lovely story for a lot of reasons, but not the least of them is, of course, they got the family got exquisite care when they were at risk of getting terrible care. But another thing that you got to notice is everybody on that unit changed. They were different caregivers because they extended themselves in this way to an undesirable family. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you for coming and talking with us today. Um, for all of you out there listening, I really highly recommend Michael's new book, Four Decades in Infant Mental Health, This Hollow Ground. Um, his stories often bring me to tears in, these, in this book and the, the, the things that you have done with your life, Michael. Um, so thank you for coming and being with us today. And uh, thank you for all for coming. And please uh, turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you head out the door. And we'll see you again for another conversation. I'm not sure who with, but we'll see. Thank you. 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 Thank you.